My name is Caroline Sutton. I am a longtime member of the OWASPA board, uh, basically since the beginning. Uh, and I'm also one of the co-founders of CoAction Publishing, which is a smaller publishing house. And I have a real privilege this afternoon of uh, chairing a session on open scholarship initiatives. So if you look at the list, you might say, wow, these are really diverse fields. But that, I think, is what is really exciting, is we're going to be able to show in the next three talks um, that actually it's not just open access to research papers anymore and not just data that we've been talking about, but actually rethinking scholarship itself um, as an open process. And so first off, uh, I'd like to uh, bring to the podium John Inglis, who is the executive director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press. And he'll be taking us through BioArchive, the preprint service for the life sciences. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation to be here. This is my first uh, visit to this particular meeting, and uh, I, it will not be my last. It's been a very stimulating couple of days. Um, I am here to talk about preprints and about our particular service for preprints. Um, I do not have to tell this audience what a preprint is. We persist in using this quaint analog term, even in this digital age. Um, but no one's come up with a better one, so here we are, with, still stuck with preprints. And the purpose of our preprint service is to permit um, authors to distribute their unpublished manuscripts, making them available for uh, dis for um, discussion, for comment, for downloading, and for action um, immediately after posting. Um, the interface to BioArchive is a deliberately simple one. Um, I was told by a designer friend of mine that simple means primitive, but uh, I, we actually rather like the simplicity of it. Um, the submission system itself is, is lightweight. It's a, stripped down version of Hiwa's bench press. Um, it delivers, uh, it takes in author's Word files and delivers to, uh, to directly to the web a PDF um, with an abstract in HTML. Um, the posting is almost immediate. We have a screening step, which I'll describe. Um, authors can revise uh, their manuscripts at any time, and both submission and access to the site are free. So the question really is, why did we start BioArchive? Or maybe I should phrase it, why did we start BioArchive? And for that, I should give you just a little bit of background. Um, I am very fortunate to work here, uh, 35 miles east of uh, New York City, uh, in an institution that is 126 years old. Um, it was one of the cradles of genetics in the United States in the 1900s. It was a crucible of the developing science of molecular biology in the 1950s and 60s. And now it has a very active research staff covering a wide range of, of disciplines linked in general by an interest in gene function. But for 80 plus years of that 126 year history, the laboratory has also been a place where scientists came to meet, to discuss, to share, to debate um, the work, the work that they were doing. That started in the 30s with uh, a single conference that has now grown to a program of about 50 a year in several locations, including China. We also have a professional education program, which starts with a graduate school, but also includes residential lab courses. And that the conferences gave rise to books in the 30s, um, the lab courses gave rise to lab manuals in the 70s, and now the publishing uh, arm of the laboratory um, is, has grown to the extent now of having uh, eight journals, about, currently about 200 books. And the, I would say that the mission of the laboratory, therefore, is both to create knowledge and to share it. And it was really in that context that the discussions about a preprint service um, 
arose. Now, we, of course, had been acutely conscious of the availability of the archive uh, preprint service for that served physics and mathematics, and you are all very familiar with that service, I'm sure. Um, we are also aware that there had been a number of efforts to begin a preprint server specifically for biology over the years, none of which had really taken off. Um, but embedded as we are in a research community, we were very conscious of what in 2011 and 2012 biologists were saying, encapsulated by these three quotes, which you can read for yourself. But the key one is the first one. I don't need to wait for peer review to tell me in my field whether a paper is any good. I can judge that for myself. And of course, there was growing frustration with the slow process of uh, conventional peer review publication, including the Cold Spring Harbor journals. Um, we're also aware that archive um, was burgeoning and, and um, part of its growth was a gradual increase in the submission rate of what you might call non-quantitative biology, um, to topics that, might, that a few years earlier were not, would not have been included in the scope of archive, uh, but um, certain uh, imaginative scientists had realized that this was a vehicle for getting their work out quickly. So with a good deal of consultation and a great deal of support from the scientific leadership of the laboratory, in November 2013, BioArchive was born. Um, since then, there has been a great deal of activity in the preprint space. There are different models for the delivery of preprints, and this audience in particular is well aware of what uh, Pete Minfield and his colleagues have done with Peer J. I'm sure you also know about Faculty of a Thousand Research, where preprints are embedded in the editorial workflow. Figshare, also to you, a very familiar repository of all kinds of uh, research outputs, including papers. Um, our model was very much that of uh, archives in which um, we set up a not-for-profit um, and w it, which was funded at least in, in the beginning by, uh, by a research organization. Um, we have seen in just in the last few months that um, there have been a number of new initiatives. Um, chem the Chem Archive was announced a few months ago and um, we, yes, we are definitely going to license them, that capital R in the middle of their name, uh, for extremely expensive amounts. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, sec, uh, the SOCH archive is uh, an initiative that hasn't quite been launched yet, but is being built by the uh, Open Science Framework at the Center for Open Science, just down the road here. And the, uh, the, the crucial, um, development is in um, this last project, which um, we're all suffering from logo envy here, uh, because that stands for Psych Archive. And uh, I think to have two scientific jokes and two Greek symbols, that's pretty clever. Um, I wish we'd thought of that. So what are the benefits of preprints? Well, um, the obvious one is that uh, it's the rapid transmission of results. It, that get out into the community for discussion and, and feedback to the authors. One of the benefits is that early career scientists, and you heard from an excellent example of one of them this morning, um, early career scientists have the opportunity to demonstrate the work that they have done, um, even though their, publica their formal publication record may not be extensive yet. Um, and that evidence of productivity may be very important when it comes to grant applications or hiring committees if those processes are willing to pay attention to preprints, which is not always the case, but that is changing. Um, in terms of accelerating communication, this is perhaps a rather unfair slide, but Steve Royal in Cambridge uh, plotted a couple of years ago the uh, time to publication of time to various stages in the publication process for a large variety of journals. And as you can see, the process is an extensive one. And uh, somewhat unfairly, we put BioArchive in there because the time from submission to posting can be as little as a few hours. 
Um, the process has, uh, is sort of di diagrammatized here. The author submits a manuscript. The author gets a proof back almost immediately. Um, the, our in-house staff check the manuscript submission, and we have various criteria, which I'm happy to talk about later, for not accepting a manuscript, mostly to do with format. Um, sometimes we get manuscripts that aren't science or are um, not any kind of sense at all. Um, and we also have concerns about potential health uh, implications for posted manuscripts. If the manuscript passes our in-house screen, it goes into the hands of a group of 60 young principal investigators we call affiliates, whose task is to assure us that what they are seeing really is science. And if an affiliate uh, approves the manuscript, then it goes live, and then it becomes publicly visible. Um, the author can then come back in, the bottom line there, the author can come back in and update that manuscript um, at any time. So the features of our service are that the manuscript gets a date stamp and a DOI. The author can choose to characterize the article either as new results or confirmatory or contradictory. Um, the author can put can choose one subject category uh, only, um, and we have 26 available. Um, we allow the author to have a, a wide range of license choices, CC BY license choices. Um, on the site itself, there are article metrics, which are publicly available, and alt metrics. There is commenting, um, which we, for which we use the discuss module. Um, and if a, man, if a preprint finds its way into the formal literature, then we create a link to the published version. Um, and then Google Scholar has done a remarkably good job of indexing preprints and, also, and aggregating them with uh, the different versions that uh, Scholar finds. So stepping quickly through the site, this I'm afraid is not very clear, but the um, the highlighted areas here are um, simply the DOI, um, and a reminder that this is uh, not a peer-reviewed um, publication. Um, there's the download button, there's the subject area highlighted. Uh, in the second tab, there is information about the preprint, which contains uh, things like the, the links to previous versions. Um, and then um, the metrics uh, tab, shows the number of downloads, the alt metrics, and, and so on. Uh, and there are also, there's also a tab for supplementary data, should there be such a thing. Um, and in the particular case of um, articles categorized in uh, clinical trials, then we also include the uh, trial ID, um, which is shown there. So in the nearly three years that BioArchive has been going. Uh, we have now accumulated 6,000 posted manuscripts, and that's a very, very large percentage of the submissions that were uh, sent to us. 30% uh, of those manuscripts have been revised at least once, um, some of them many more than that. The total number of authors involved in the service so far accumulates to 26,000. They come from 2,600 institutions worldwide. And as I said, we track the publication of preprints and have done so uh, to, and found that 60% of what has been posted on BioArchive has now appeared in a journal. Um, in total, over 300 of them, ranging from the most general and the most prominent to the most specialized and most obscure and certainly ranging from open access journals to subscription-based journals. Um, the interesting thing is, what about the other 40%? Some of that is perhaps, some of these are publications that we haven't found with our automated system. Um, some of them are manuscripts that authors perhaps decided to abandon. And an increasingly interesting category are maybe authors who have decided that putting their manuscript on bioarchive is enough and that they don't wish to pursue formal publication. This is a chart showing the um, rather 
uh, impressive rise in the submission rate. Again, you can't see the numbers, but um, last month uh, in, in August was the largest month yet, yet. That's about 450 manuscripts there. You can see um, the dark bars are original submissions and the revisions are the uh, lighter bars on top. Um, in terms of the subject matter, um, all 26 categories are, have preprints in them, and inevitably there is a skew towards certain disciplines. Um, this is, uh, in these, dis these particular disciplines, like bioinformatics and genomics, there was already a familiarity with the concept of preprints. Often they have been trained by archive. And if you actually look at um, the history of archive, you see that it began in the field of high energy physics, but as the 20 year history here shows, then gradually other parts of physics have caught up and we are fairly convinced that that will happen in biology as well. In terms of usage, um, that too is, is rapidly rising. Again, you, you can't read the numbers, but basically we're looking at sort of a million accesses a month fairly steadily now. The particular peak in uh, June was a somewhat notorious paper that came from NIH to do with um, cell phone radiation, which you may have read about in your newspaper, and uh, that was um, certainly uh, a tremendously popular uh, manuscript that particular month. Um, feedback and discussion is, is clearly a very important part of the whole sort of preprint concept and experience, and I'm glad to say that um, there seems to be a great deal of it going on, and that takes various forms. Blog, there, have, there are a number of blogs have, that have been set up to specifically discuss preprints in certain subject areas, uh, population genetics, uh, cancer, uh, neuroscience and cell biology in particular. There is direct commenting on the, on the site itself. Um, at the moment, somewhere between 11 and 15 percent of manuscripts have comments, which may not sound a lot, but it's a great deal more than any of our journals have ever managed to achieve. And referring back to uh, earlier discussions at this meeting, the, the commenting really has been remarkably collegial. Uh, that we have had almost no instance whatsoever of flaming or trolling or, or um, behavior that we felt was inappropriate. Um, a tremendously important part of bioarchives growth has been social media. Twitter has been um, a tremendous friend to bioarchive. That number of 58,000 tweets is actually way out of date. I made this slide several months ago. I don't know what it is now, but there is an enormous number of, uh, of tweet, there's an, a great deal of tweeting going on around, um, around the presence of, of uh, preprints. And of course, the, the great unknown for us is, is the extent to which authors are receiving direct and private uh, comment back through email or for, from uh, showing up at meetings like this and being greeted by someone who had read their preprint on BioArchive. Anecdotally, we know that happens a lot. So, looking at progress, um, we are tremendously pleased with what has happened so far. We try not to be complacent about that. There is an awfully long way to go. Um, it's a tiny number of the uh, available uh, content in uh, biomedical publishing, but there's no question that there are more biologists who are posting and reading preprints. Um, journals have responded very favorably to the advent of preprints and have, if they did not have preprint friendly policies before, a very, very large proportion of them have changed to uh, adapt to that situation. And the ones that haven't have uh, mostly in the area where they are concerned about clinical information. Um, there was a rule change uh, last year in which the NIH Biosketch now permits something more than formally published publications, and we are hoping for new um, pronouncements from NIH over the next few months, which will make the position on preprints absolutely clear. And that, I have no doubt, will be followed by other funders who will also follow NIH's lead in uh, perhaps, who knows, perhaps even mandating that their grantees um, use uh, a preprint service. So, there has, there has been many changes in terms of community awareness. 
um, one very helpful uh, development was the appearance of a group called a ASAP Bio, a group of scientists who decided to get together to advocate for preprints. They have had now three meetings. Um, this one uh, was the, uh, I think this was the first one that was written up by some of the attendees in science, basically making the case that preprints are important for the advancement of science. Um, and uh, that conversation around ASAP Bio continues. They are considering various models for what a preprint service might look like in future. And they are interacting with the research community in various ways. Again, I'm sorry this is so in, in illegible, but the middle um, block there is just simply uh, uh, the product of a survey they did where the, the conclusion was that not many people yet had posted preprints, but the ones who had, had had a very satisfactory experience. Um, this is just a reminder that journals have changed their policies. This is a Wikipedia page that keeps track of those policies, and in, pu publishers are encouraged to go in and up update those, those data. Um, Bioarchive references are now beginning to appear in the literature, and conventions for that are, have emerged. And we were, of course, very pleased that Crossref uh, blessed uh, the advent of preprints uh, several, several months ago um, uh, in, in, the, in the way that's described here. Um, there are emerging tools that help um, the research community manage uh, preprints. Here, is, here are two examples of uh, preprint-specific search engines, one from the uh, University of Pittsburgh Library, the one down at the bottom is called PrePubMed and searches across a number of repositories. Um, a new but particularly interesting project, again, has come from the Center for Open Science, which is a preprint search tool that delves into a large number of uh, preprint databases. And I, if you don't know about this yet, I, I recommend looking at it. So very, uh, a very effective tool. Um, one of the other things that uh, we have done at BioArchive was to try to place preprints in the broader ecosystem of biomedical communication, and that means partnering with journals. This happens in two ways. With a small set of journals, we, are, we have a, a, an arrangement by which an author can be offered the opportunity to deposit a manuscript on BioArchive at the same time as it's submitted to the journal for peer review. The, the limitation right now is that we're, using, that we're working with a set of journals that share our manuscript submission system. In a few months, that will be broadened out to include the broader set of journals who are using other systems. Um, but at the moment, the, the most popular uh, mechanism that we've introduced is the opportunity of one-click submission of a manuscript that's been deposited on BioArchive uh, and the opportunity to put it into the submission system of a journal. And at the moment, we have about 40 journals in that set. There are more in the queue. Um, if anyone here is interested in knowing more about that on behalf of their journals, I'd be very happy to talk about it. Um, that is proving to be very popular among scientists, and um, we certainly plan to develop that. Um, as far as further integration is concerned, one of the intriguing things is that um, we are seeing, as I mentioned, uh, various forms of commentary going on on, pri on, uh, on preprints, and the question is how could that be made to interface with more formal peer review mechanisms? And there are quite a few ideas floating around about that. Uh, in the meantime, on Twitter, people are delightedly announcing that their, they, their paper has been recruited for this or that journal um, simply because it's been spotted on, uh, on BioArchive. So that, as far as we're concerned, is a great development. Um, we're also trying to integrate preprints with conferences. This, we have a process we call channel development in which people who come to a conference can have the opportunity to put their manuscript up for uh, inspection by the other people who are at the conference. That is um, just beginning. And we're also working in various ways with societies who are interested in taking feeds from BioArchive 
in areas that they are particularly interested in, where they may in, in themselves have channels for that, for that particular kind of content. Um, and on the society's site, there is the opportunity to have commentary and discussion and blogs and so on, and possibly interaction with the society's own journals. So these all really represent our vision of BioArchive as a, a hub in the communication of biomedical science. Um, the confirmatory and contradictory results uh, opportunity, which I didn't really uh, dwell on, but uh, roughly 5% of the manuscripts that are deposited fall into these categories. And that, as, as um, was alluded to earlier today, the opportunity to publish or to, to disseminate these kinds of results is going to be very important for ongoing concerns about reproducibility. Meanwhile, journals, in our view, do the absolutely vital work of certification and also we, by interacting with blogs and so on, we have the opportunity for discussion of findings as, as they emerge. Um, our priorities are um, to uh, expand the journals available, uh, to um, expand the ingestion of manuscripts that have been submitted directly to journals. We're developing APIs for various purposes. We are expanding the governance of this service we're also looking at various kinds of services for authors, which include the annotation technology hypothesis, and we need to continue to advocate for preprints and also be sure that we have a sustainable future for the service. There are a whole host of questions around preprints. I'm not going to go through all of these. Perhaps you might want to ask some of those in the discussion. Meanwhile, none of this would happen without a very dedicated team particularly my co-partner in, in crime, Richard Sever, but we have a very supportive group of colleagues who keep this 24-7 service running. Our affiliates are our sounding board about what matters to the scientific community. Highwire Press has rock-solid technology that keeps this going. Partner publishers, partner submission systems, including EJP and editorial manager, the laboratory <coughs> and the Lowry Foundation keep us going financially. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. While well, Leila is fixing the next uh, slide presentation for us, I have to say the next speaker gave a presentation in the lightning rounds last year, and I think you were given six minutes, eight minutes, yeah. and we realized I need to hear more. So I'm really excited to invite Jenna Mikowski to come to the podium and talk about what's happening in anthropology, because actually there's some really exciting things that I think that we can take and be inspired in other fields with. Welcome, Jenna. Thank you. So as Carolyn mentioned, my name is Jenna, and I'm an editor at Alexander Street. And I had the opportunity to speak last year at OASPO. It's my first time presenting with this, with this conference. Um, and I was thrilled to be invited again this year. So I'm going to sort of focus this presentation on giving a bit of an update on the project. Um, Alexander Street is actually based uh, just down the road in Alexandria. Um, so I was a little bit sad that I didn't get a trip you know, to Paris or to Copenhagen or something else like that out of the deal. But I'm very excited to be here. And so thank you for the opportunity. So, when I spoke last year, I actually started out by asking if anybody has a background in anthropology. And I was surprised by how many people raised their hands. So I'm going to do that again, just because I'm curious. Does anybody have a background in anthropology? One? Cool. Just curious. I like to do it at these conferences. Um, so um, I'm going to be speaking about this project that we've been working on and developing over the last year. We've actually implemented it and launched it since I last presented this time last year, so we've got quite a bit of updates to go through. But I wanted to focus specifically on two things. Um, one is the funding, well, the funding models that we've been able to implement and which have worked, which haven't. Um, and then the platform as well, how we've been able to present this project and this content in an open access environment. Um, I wanted to start with a little bit of context, though, and some of you may recognize the slide. I used it last year, but I just wanted to kind of um, give a bit of context and background about our company. Um, Alexander Street is an academic database publisher and content provider in the humanities and social sciences. 
And our primary users and our primary audience are at the higher, in the higher ed space. So we, do, we curate collections of streaming video, which are used largely in the undergraduate space for teaching courses at the undergraduate level. And then we also do collections of digital primary sources, which are used um, largely in the, at the graduate level space. Um, so we focus largely on the humanities and social sciences. We have gotten a little bit into STEM, but we tend to be more focused on the, um, the softer sciences. So we essentially, uh, we license educational streaming rights to content, and then we curate specific research databases around themes. So our, our company got started with the mission of making silent voices heard, and we would curate content that would sort of be, um, you know, left in the archive basement, in other words. So like we would focus on perspectives of women during the Civil War. So we have women's letters and diaries collections that we would digitize and make available. So the idea is kind of to give perspective that might be overlooked in history books, or open up resources that might not other be part of, otherwise be part of mainstream research. So libraries then subscribe to our databases and we create a royalty generation model for our content providers. Um, everybody affiliated with the institution has access to the content. We digitize it, we index it for findability, we transcribe it, um, and it's cross-searchable on our multimedia platform. And so anthropology is one of our key disciplines that we focus on, and I'm responsible for managing and growing the portfolio of content that we have in that field. And coming from an academic background in anthropology myself, um, I've always known that open access is an important key of, in the publishing, uh, publishing model for the, the discipline. And for example, flagship, flagship journals like the Cultural Anthropology Journal that's published by the AAA, the American Anthropology Association, that's open access. Um, but the importance of um, publishing an open access became really clear to me about 18 months ago when I first started this project, um, doing research for a project that we're, we're calling Anthropological Fieldwork Online. Um, and it's largely a, a fieldwork um, primary source database. Um, but in anthropology, we do work with, um, this is a bit of background on the type of content that we have, um, streaming video, published monographs, recordings, and then rare and primary, you know, unpublished materials. And so we partner with organizations like Documentary Educational Resources, which is a catalog of film, um, the Royal Anthropological Institute, which is an archive. We partner with individual filmmakers. All of their content is part of our platform. Um, but with the specific database that I was looking at building, um, the goal was to digitize the original primary source research that underpinned the, the great ethnographies of the 20th century. And so in the field of anthropology, um, a little bit different from the STEM fields or some of the hard sciences, the way that research is undertaken, the methodology, um, it's called largely participant observation methodology. So an anthropologist goes into the field for a number of years. Um, they live with the community. They learn the language. They eat with the community. They research you know, with the community. They do collaborative studies. And over the course of those years, they collect hundreds and hundreds of pages of handwritten notes, um, audio recordings, oral histories, notes on the language, all sorts of stuff regarding the culture and the society of, of a particular group of people, often in collaboration with the people in the community. Um, then they come back from the field, wherever they may live. They spend another number of years analyzing all of that data, distilling it into a theoretical model, and then publishing books, articles, ethnographies. And the ultimate goal is to come up with a final published ethnography. Um, but then what's left are all these thousands and thousands of pages of handwritten notes, hundreds and hundreds of files of digital recordings, um, and I wanted to create a point of access to these thousands of pieces of um, data that are essentially left, not left behind, but are sort of inaccessible in an archive unless you actually go there to, to research. And I wanted to focus specifically on historical content. So I began to identify um, some of the seminal anthropologists of the 20th century looking at syllabi, so what's commonly taught. Um, and I began to have conversations with the archives where this content is held. So, for example, Bronislaw Malinowski was a really prominent 20th century researcher. Um, at the, just, just after World War I, he spent three years in the, uh, Papua New Guinea doing research. Um, his papers were held at the London School of Economics and at Yale. So his stuff was split across the Atlantic Ocean, um, held in two different archives. And so we began having conversations with his estate, his literary estate, his family, and those universities. <laughs> and just a couple of other examples, um, Margaret Mead, uh, her papers at the Library of Congress, and so we began having conversations there as well with her daughter, Mary Catherine Bateson, and the Library of Congress. Um, Ruth Benedict, her papers are at Vassar College. Um, and I guess the, the theme that I took out of all of these conversations, the more that I began to speak with these archives, is that archives have different needs and missions when it comes to making the content available. Sometimes they align with the literary states, and sometimes they don't. 
Um, some archives are interested in generating royalties to help them with their mission-driven work. Um, others may have open access missions, but they may or may not have the resources to digitize that content and to host it. So we began to think about creating different publishing models for archives that would address these different open access needs and missions. And I love this conference so much because it, it really sheds light on the myriad of um, open publishing initiatives and journals and the world of books. Um, but what we found as we began to dig in and do this research is that there's less attention being given to publishing of archival sources and of archival primary sources. Um, but that's sort of where we started, by looking at what's out there. And we found that there are three different ways that archives may choose to publish their work. Um, one is when access is, is funded by some sort of for-profit entity, whether it's a publisher like Alexander Street, a private individual. Um, Accessible Archives is an initiative like this. It's an online portal that has hosts thousands of pages of primary sources. Um, this is you know, one potential method out there. Um, one of the, the caveats or the drawbacks is that you're, you know, you're limited to private funding, and so there's always the risk that the business could go under, or you know, the, the long-term sustainability is sometimes called into question. But that's one method. Um, another method that we found most prominently is when the content is funded um, by a government or a nonprofit entity. Um, this is often the best in terms of long-term OA sustainability, um, but it's often limited. There's limited funds available. And then we found another model as well, um, sort of commonly known in this space as the sales threshold model. And it's essentially like a crowdsourced approach to digitizing content where an organization will identify content that they want to make open. Um, they'll go to libraries or other funding institutions and ask people to essentially contribute or to donate. Um, and they'll have sort of like a Kickstarter campaign. And once they reach a certain point, um, once they make enough money essentially to undertake the project, they'll do so and the content becomes available. Um, obviously the drawback here is that um, the, uh, you, you don't have access to the content until you reach that threshold, so you could be waiting for an indeterminate amount of time. So all of these three models are out there, and they all work really well in certain contexts, and we wanted to see if we could create another option as well, just to create another pathway or another channel for expanding um, the amount of open content that's available. Um, another challenge that we uncovered as we began to do research um, and explore these different publishing models um, is the, the issue of presentation or of platform. Um, and so researchers, we found in talking and doing some market research, um, researchers are looking for and they expect a seamless research experience when they're navigating their content. So regardless of whether content is available um, in an open access environment or in a subscription environment that they get through their library, they just want to be able to find the content and access it and use it in their research. And so we needed to be able to respond to that by creating a platform that would essentially seamlessly marry free and subscription content. So we began to explore ways to address these two challenges, first coming up with the publishing models that would work, and then coming up with a platform that would allow us to sort of marry these types of content together. Um, so the first thing that we looked at, we're, we're coming up with a publishing model that could address the various needs of the, the different um, needs and missions of archives. Um, so we created a three-path approach to, to publishing content. Um, in the first approach, this is essentially our traditional um, model. Um, it's royalty-bearing, and archive will essentially uh, agree to make the content available in a subscription database. Um, through that database, we then generate royalties back to the archive. Then we also came up with a delayed model, or we call this our hybrid model. Um, and in this model, essentially the content is available in a subscription model for a period of time, usually about seven years. Um, but then after that point, after we've essentially recouped the cost of digitizing and been able to channel some royalties back, we flip the content. There's been a lot of talk about flipping journals. Um, I think there's a parallel here in terms of flipping archival content. We flip the content and make it freely available. This works really well for large sets of content where there's a really large overhead cost to digitize them. Um, works really well for content that needs a lot of historic preservation as well. Um, the costs tend to be a lot higher. Um, and it also works well when there's um, different perspectives being brought to the table. So when a literary estate, for example, may be interested in royalties, but the archive, the holding institution, wants the content to be free. And so this is a great way to sort of bring those different perspectives to the table and be able to have a conversation about ways that we can compromise and, and do both. 
And then our third model is what we're calling our sponsored model. And this is a, an initiative that we're undertaking as a company, as an organization, where we're essentially taking 10% of the revenue that comes from the subscriptions in the first model and putting it into an open access pool. And with this pool, we're digitizing content. And we've just launched our first collection um, in this model, um, the Ruth Benedict Papers. So Ruth Benedict was an anthropologist at the 1920s. She did a lot of research in the Southwest United States. Um, her papers are at Vassar College. Um, and as of, knock on wood, tomorrow morning, uh, these papers are going to be free and open to the public on our platform. So this is just a quick summary of the two, uh, the two routes to open access that we've been uh, using most prominently in terms of working with archives. Um, like I said, the, the hybrid open access models, after a period of time, the content becomes open once we've been able to kind of recoup the costs. Um, and then the sponsored models where we essentially um, channel a, a segment of our revenue into an open access pool. Um, both of these, we've been using both of these. Both of them are actually quite popular with, with the archives that we work with. Um, so then I mentioned the other challenge, in addition, so once you've got the content published and have it available, the other challenge then is making it available to scholars, to researchers, in a way that is seamless. Um, and so uh, the solution that we came up to, you know, with this, with this issue, this challenge, is to open up our platform. Um, and this, again, knock on wood, uh, by tomorrow <laughs> should be implemented. Um, so our platform, um, at one point, has, has always been available to libraries who, who subscribe. Um, but what we've decided to do is to open up um, all of the metadata so that if you're a researcher, you come across our content via Google. Um, whether it's free or whether it's behind a subscription paywall, you'll be able to access the metadata and cross-search all of it in an open and seamless environment. And if your library subscribes, you're automatically authenticated. And so you have access then to everything that your library subscribes to, whether you're on campus or off. Um, so um, I had been hoping, so the way, we, the way our platform works, we've been, there's sort of a 48 hour period where it was, it was it's going to go open at some point within those 48 hours. Um, it hasn't gone open yet, <laughs> so hopefully by tomorrow morning. So I was going to do a quick demo, but it's not quite there yet. Um, but I do have some screenshots just to kind of demonstrate. Um, what, what happens is that essentially um, when you do a search, you'll be able to see which content is open, which content is in a subscription, and you'll be able to have access, you know, if you're part of an institution, you'll be able to access via your institution. If it's open access content, you'll just have open access and all of the metadata will be available regardless. Um, and one of our, our main goals for this was opening up the content via multiple, um, multiple access points. So whether you're, you're accessing via Google, and we found that most, something like over 80% of research begins with Google. Um, so whether you're beginning with Google or beginning with your, your library's mark records, your library catalog, um, we're, what we're essentially trying to do is open up the different access points to the content as much as possible. Um, as of hopefully tomorrow, you can go to this website actually and see the Ruth Benedict papers. Um, chances are your library also subscribes to some of our other databases, so all of the, you'll be able to see how it's the cross-searchable functionality works, um, as well as how the metadata works. And so um, I, I hope these slides, I think they're, they'll be on the website, so you'll be able to go to this um, at your convenience and check it out. So, thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Um, our next speaker is someone I've been chasing for a number of years to get to our conference. So for me, no matter what she says, this is a victory. Um, <laughs> no, I know it'll be good. Um, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Kathleen Fitzpatrick, uh, who is the Executive Director and Director of Scholarly Communication at the Modern Language Association. Um, and she is going to be talking to us about networking scholarly communication. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here, and thank you, Caroline, for being so persistent um, in getting me here. All right. Success. Um, so I do come to these questions of open access from deep, deep in the humanities, um, which means that you know I, I bring a slightly different perspective on um, how certain of these things can be done, but not, I think, on, on the larger goals at hand. Um, this talk is, is in large part an argument that's on behalf of um, one means of serving and supporting the public good to which Heather Joseph referred yesterday. And I wanna start this talk um, with
with a look at the May 2016 purchase of the Social Science Research Network by Elsevier. Now this purchase set off a firestorm among researchers and others interested in open access scholarly communication um, who were worried about what would become of the network and of its data, and not without reason. Um, the acquisition of such a well-established research sharing network by a major commercial publisher not only presented the possibility that the company would seek to close down access to the network store of research papers or that it would mine them for other forms of saleable data, um, but also alongside their prior acquisition of Mendeley seemed to indicate that Elsevier sought to vertically integrate the entirety of the research workflow, an indication that of course is later intensified by the patent the company recently received for an um, online peer review process. Now Elsevier unsurprisingly argued that this kind of integration would bring great benefits to authors. Um, it would enable them to move seamlessly and fluidly from research to drafting to journal submission. Um, but many researchers expressed concerns about what such all-encompassing lock-in might do to their community, and not least to the values that that community espoused. This concern was borne out a couple of months later um, when SSRN users began reporting that shared materials perceived not to be in compliance with a newly articulated copyright transfer policy were being removed from the network. So this is at the point when the, uh, the Authors Alliance emerges into the conversation and responds by asking whether it might be time for authors to leave SSRN. Um, and other groups, including the Association of Research Libraries, pick up that charge. Now, this is only the most recent call among researchers to abandon the apparently free and open networks on which they've come to rely. Earlier in 2016, the Twitter hashtag deleteacademiaedu called upon scholars to close down their accounts on the popular scholarly social network in response to the network's suggestion that it might begin to charge authors for recommendations, a move that felt to many uncomfortably like a kind kind of academic payola. Um, in each of these cases, many researchers were prompted to seek alternatives to their accustomed community spaces when the specter of monetization emerged in the midst of the community, revealing a discomfort with the intrusion of commercial enterprises into academic workflows. Um, as Paolo Mangifico has pointed out, however, this focus on the role that capitalism should or shouldn't play in scholarly communication runs the risk of obscuring a larger, more important point, that companies providing the platforms supporting these research communities did not share the researchers' core values, and that it might be a fruitful moment for scholars to consider finding services provided by organizations whose interests more clearly map to their own, interests that were driven by the same mission as the scholars themselves. Only through this kind of value alignment, the argument goes, um, can scholars in their institutions become reasonably confident that the platforms that are supporting their research communities will develop and evolve appropriately with the scholars using those platforms. Now this is to say that the crises of conscience that have visited online research communities um, have at long last highlighted for the scholarly communication landscape a situation that's been visible in other sectors of social media for a while. I mean, when it comes to networks, openness is a virtue, but other determinants may matter as much or more. Now put another way, I mean, there is open and then there is open. Um, and while difference may seem semantic, it is anything but. SSRN and academia.edu have long been open in the sense that any interested user can create a free account, connect with other users, share work, and so forth. But neither service is open in the deeper sense of providing member understanding of and input into their business and sustainability models. Neither is focused on interoperability with other systems in the research infrastructure or in sharing research data with other entities, except as it might provide a source of revenue. Neither is in any deep sense in dialogue with or connected to the research community. 
Now, these services may permit any scholar to contribute their work to the platform, but the scholars themselves wind up with precious little control over the disposition of that work or the platform on which they rely. So boiling this situation down to if you're not paying, you're the product getting sold um, gets at something important for scholars to consider. It's a crucial caveat emptor about the business models that we in, in inadvertently support um, and their potential ramifications for our research workflows. But this is nonetheless a vast oversimplification. I mean, there have long been more possible options for research services than user pays or user gets data mined and sold to advertisers. Um, perhaps most significant among them is the collective funding model that's long been provided by membership organizations such as learned and professional societies. Um, these societies, since the Royal Society of London, have been founded for the express purpose of fostering and facilitating communication amongst their members and between those members and the broader intellectual world. Now, early on in their history, that communication took the form of letters that circulated to the membership and meetings at which member work was presented and discussed. And over time, those practices formalized into the journals and conferences with which we're familiar today. And while different societies have different membership policies and requirements and thus are not open in the sense espoused by many web-based social platforms in which anyone can participate without cost, they are ideally open in that other sense. They're governed by their members as collectives working in the interest of their members. So while I strongly believe that that latter sense of openness is far more important than the former, the challenge presented by the current moment in both in internet-based scholarly communication and in the increasingly precarious academic environment that we face today is nonetheless finding a way to support and sustain both kinds of openness. And how can we create research communities online that invite everyone to participate, that are transparent about their governance and community-oriented in their values, and that remain both technologically and fiscally sustainable. And this, I would argue, is one of the places in which the progress that scholarly communication has made toward open access has gotten tangled up in priorities that do not reflect the actual goals of the scholarly community. Now, the Budapest Open Access Initiative um, defined its goals in a statement with which I'm sure everyone here is quite familiar, and I'm not going to go into the entirety of the statement. Um, just to note that, that this definition is expansive and it's profoundly idealistic. Um, it, and yet, despite that idealism, it, has, it may have played a role in a couple of contemporary problems that we face. Um, first, it made it possible for many to read free availability on the public internet and go no further into the definition. Uh, but the real impact of open access's openness lies further down in the definition, in the ways that the products of scholarly research can be built upon and reused, though that goal winds up a little easy to overlook here. And the second issue follows from this and represents a problem at the very heart of what has happened since. By focusing our attention on access, and you may not be able to tell that right there in the center of the paragraph, financial, legal, or technical barriers is highlighted. Um, by focusing our attention on access, and in particular on the elimination of financial, legal, or technical barriers to the consumption of the products of scholarly research, we wind up restricting ourselves to affecting the ability of end users to, to see the stuff that we create. Now, it's crucial that such consumer access be made as open and seamless as possible, but in focusing on that end of things, we don't always end up addressing concerns about what it is that we're creating or how we're creating it. And this is how we end up with an increasingly pervasive system of ostensibly open access publishing that relies on the simple substitution of article processing fees, which is to say author side fees, right, for the revenue that was previously produced through sales and subscriptions. Too little about the system itself winds up changing, and in fact, in many cases, the existing formats and venues and publishers are able to further retrench themselves as the only viable, trustworthy options. 
The, the major substantive shift that this particular model of open then brings about is that the, in, the inequities involved in it move from the consumer side of the equation to the producer side, right? So that only researchers in grant-rich fields or at institutions with substantial research support can end up um, being able to afford to disseminate the work that they produce. So if our goals are not just to make the work that's being produced by well-heeled funder or well-funded researchers in well-funded fields or at well-heeled institutions openly available on the internet, but rather to facilitate the open communication among all researchers in all fields across all institutions in ways that promote not just the free consumption of the work that's already being done, but that support and facilitate the production of more new exciting kinds of work from more areas of the research ecosystem than ever before. I mean, if we genuinely espouse these more expansive goals, then what we need is not just ways to make existing publications open without charge, but instead an entirely new, open, community-oriented, sustainable research infrastructure. What we need is a model of collective, cooperative, sustainable support for open platforms, an architecture that makes those platforms' data not just available, but interoperable, shareable, reusable, and an ethic that makes commitment to those platforms and the organizations that provide them an important sense of, or an, impo an important element of professional identity. And these are our goals um, for Humanities Commons, which is a developing network that's sponsored by a collective of scholarly societies, but that's open to participation from any researcher or practitioner who wants to join, that is mission-driven, um, committed to the needs and interests of that community. Humanities Commons is our effort, first and foremost, to leverage the collectives that are represented by scholarly societies on behalf of the common good. So a bit of background, um, for those of you who may not be fully familiar with the MLA, we're the largest scholarly society in the humanities, representing more than 25,000 members across North America and around the world, um, members who teach and study a very wide range of languages, literatures, and cultures. Um, with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we launched a social network called MLA Commons in 2013 in order to provide those members with a platform for communication and collaboration, um, both in order to extend year-round the kinds of conversations that take place at the convention um, and to provide means for members to share their scholarly work directly with one another. Um, within about 30 seconds of launching the platform, however, um, we began to hear from our members about their desire to connect not just with one another, um, but with colleagues in other areas of the humanities. Our members work in increasingly interdisciplinary ways, and so we started looking for ways that we might support those connections across fields. Um, MLA Commons is built on the Commons in a Box platform. Commons in a Box is a project of the uh, Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And CBOX is in turn built on WordPress and BuddyPress, which together provide an open source solution for organizations seeking rich social networking and publishing capabilities. Um, the key aspect of this is that it is all open source software and we have a very strong commitment to um, ensuring that everything remains open and openly shared across the internet. MLA Commons supports a wide range of member interactions, um, including public group discussions that members can freely join, public, uh, private group discussions, some of which members um, can request access to and others of which are restricted based on member authorizations, like being a member of a committee, for instance. Uh, members can also contribute to or create a wide variety of web-based publications. They can participate in collaborative document authoring and more. Um, members can create extended CV-like profiles linking to their work on the commons and across the web. And they can deposit their work, um, preprints, data sets, presentations, syllabi, you name it, um, to core which is the repository that we've integrated into the commons. And they can share that work directly with the commons groups to which they belong. So we partnered with the Center for Digital Research and Scholarship at the Columbia University Libraries in Building Core, which is a, a Fedora solar-based repository. And with the help, uh, with the support of the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, we built a WordPress plugin that provides the user interface for depositing, entering metadata, discovering, and sharing work in the repository. 
Now, what's most important, I think, about CORE is its fusion of a library quality repository, right, adhering to commonly accepted metadata standards, employing digital object identifiers, and so forth, um, with a social network, right, meaning that not only is stuff being put into the repository, and not only can that stuff be found there, but it's also being actively shared and used. Um, members can deposit their work and, and share it directly with the groups that they belong to on the commons, and those groups receive notifications of new work that they might be interested in. Um, even more, we recently received an implementation grant from the NEH that will enable us in our next round of development to work with a group of libraries to ensure that CORE is fully interoperable with, a, with library repositories, but also with a range of other scholarly data services. In the meantime, though, we've also been investigating ways of expanding the commons to create the kinds of interdisciplinary linkages for which our members asked. Um, with further support from the Mellon Foundation, we first undertook a planning process and we're now deep into a pilot project that's designed to connect multiple proprietary commons instances, each serving the membership of a scholarly society. Um, our partners in this pilot project are the Association for Jewish Studies, the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and the College Art Association. So while any interested researcher or practitioner in the humanities will be able to create a free account on the Humanities Commons Hub, regardless of their institutional affiliation or employment status or society membership or what have you, um, members of those societies will receive additional access to the resources of the societies and they'll be able to participate in the discussions um, that those societies hold. And they'll be able to access everything to which they're entitled with a single sign-on, right? And therefore maintain a single profile that extends across the network. Um, I, I'm actually kind of relieved that you can't really see our design at this point because it's more or less non-existent. Um, we're, we're still wireframing at this point. Um, but you, you may or may not be able to get the basic idea. Um, this is the profile of Jane Smith um, who is an assistant professor of Slavic literature and is as such a member of both the MLA and ACES. Creating an account on Humanities Commons gives her access to MLA Commons and to ACES Commons, um, and she's able to create a profile on the network that will appear on all three sites. Her academic interests will link her to others across the entirety of the network with those same interests, um, enabling her to find potential collaborators and colleagues with whom to share work. Um, she'll be able to deposit work in core. the impact that the work has um, by aggregating information about how the work is downloaded, cited, and used. Um, she'll be able to start an individual blog or to create a group blog or to contribute to an experimental publication housed anywhere within the sites that she has access. And we hope that through integrations between Humanities Commons and other key scholarly data sources, um, to be able to create an environment in which Jane might be able to leverage her university credentials to seamlessly use her library's research resources and then link to those resources in discussions within her communities on Humanities Commons. And similarly, that she'll be able to share work using our disciplinary or interdisciplinary repository, as the case may be, and have that work automatically represented in her institutional repository. And it's not just tenure track researchers or researchers whose societies are already part of the network who will be able to benefit from it. Um, this is John Doe, not that you can see him. Um, but um, he is a graduate student in history and he's likewise going to be able to benefit from um, creating an account on Humanities Commons despite the fact that his society hasn't yet joined the Federation. Um, he won't be able to participate in discussions on those sites where he's not a member, but he can deposit and share work with the larger Humanities Commons community. And our hope, in fact, is that his active participation and the active participation of his colleagues will draw his society to join the Federation to come where their members already are, um, to draw them into more active participation into, in society business, and to support the kinds of open interdisciplinary work that their members like ours want to do. 
And we're going to need those societies to support the network in order for it to succeed. Our goal is to reach full sustainability for humanities commons within five years, shifting from that time from grant-based support um, to a funding model based largely on annual fees paid into a common fund by societies. And we expect, based on the experiences of projects like Archive, um, that we'll need to be prepared to do some fundraising as well um, in order not just to support the existing infrastructure, but also the ongoing development, the maintenance, the technical support, and the community facilitation that a network like this requires. And we're also in the process of developing a governance model, though, um, that will grant both the participating societies and individual members a voice in setting the network's future directions. And that, finally, is the most crucial aspect of the openness of Humanities Commons. Um, not just that anyone can create an account free of charge, and not just that the broader public will be able to access the material shared there, um, but that the network is and will remain not-for-profit, that it will be sustained and governed by scholars like you, as public television would say. Um, in order for this to succeed, though, we're going to need scholars to encourage their membership organizations to participate, and then to support in turn those organizations that do this work on their behalf. Um, the development of truly open, mission-driven scholarly communities thus requires that societies and scholars alike embrace a, a shift in the locus of value um, in joining a scholarly society in the contemporary world, right? Rather than that value residing in the receipt of member-only materials like journal subscriptions or convention registration discounts, in the age of scholarly networks, the primary value in membership may instead lie in the ability to participate in community conversations conversations and processes. And that participation is key, right? It's the last major hurdle to genuine openness. Beyond open access, beyond sustainability, lies collective action. One of the problems with getting scholars to leave SSRN or to delete academia.edu is that same issue that's been faced unsuccessfully by those who've sought to develop open alternatives to Facebook. And these networks are, su are successful precisely because that's where everyone is. And having developed such a solid center of gravity, even a dissatisfied community can be hard to move. Um, so we're going to need help getting them to move. Um, we're encouraging everyone to visit hcommons.org, sign up for more information. We're going to be um, actually seeking beta testers now. Um, we're going to begin that beta testing in October, followed by a public beta in November. Um, and we really want to encourage folks to, to, to support the societies that are doing this work on their behalf, um, to be able to, to keep nonprofit organizations involved in providing the community-focused, um, sustainable research infrastructure that can facilitate new kinds of open work by new kinds of open scholars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. The um, floor is open for questions. We've got time for a few before we move on to our last session. Here we go. Don Samuelak from Editage. A uh, couple of questions for Dr. Inglis about um, archive databases with respect to publication. One question that's always uh, I've been curious about is how, as these archives become mainstream as publications, how are they going to be, how is copyright going to be handled? Because then they're going to be republished in another journal as these become journals. And then, well, author may own copyright of the original one, now maybe in a subscription journal of which copyright is turned over, but it's not turned over in the archive. So I'm just curious how that's going to be handled. Uh, it is, that was one of the things that was on my last slide as a, as a something of an open issue for discussion at this point. Um, I, one thing I should say about BioArchive is that we never talk about publishing, we talk about posting. We try and make that distinction between something that a journal does and something that a preprint service does. Um, I think there is, the last word has not been said about this matter, but I think that um, I mean, one of the reasons we offer authors the widest choice of licensing is because that further downstream towards formal publication, that author can make different choices. 
and there does not seem to have been a problem with the uh, change, with a change of um, licensing or copyright ownership as a manuscript moves from a preprint to a formal publication. It's easy to see how you can go from being restricted to more open. It's less easy to see how you can go from being open to restricted. Yeah. Um, I think that's really where the conversation with um, publishers has to evolve. So I'd like to slip in, if possible, another question. The um, po posting, whether it be posting or publication, down the road, this is going to blur, I'm sure. And so the other concern I have is with respect to cross-check. And, uh, you know, cross-check not only deals with papers that are put into a collection that is checked against for, by Authenticate for plagiarism, but they also check X number of millions of pages on the web against. And so m potentially many of these, whether these posted archives or other types of posted archives are going to be caught by, uh, by cross-check. And then these papers are going to be flagged as plagiarism in the real paper when it comes to the publisher. And I'm just wondering other mechanisms to shield these uh, posted archives away from Ithenicate or, or how is that going to be handled? Well, uh, uh, what I can say about BioArchive is that we actually, I, again, I didn't have time to go into the details of our screening, but we use Ithenicate in our screening process um, and we pick up Occasionally, we pick up uh, manuscripts that have been deposited, for example, in an institutional repository, which, as far as bioarchive is concerned, is not is not a problem. Um, I think Crosscheck is is I'm sure very aware of the increasing interest in preprints. I think this is another of those sort of uh, procedural matters that will will be worked out about how to handle these kinds of situations. Hi, I'm Eric Hellman from the Free Ebook Foundation, and I was wanting to ask Kathleen um, why the humanities in Humanities Commons? What is it about the service that is restricting it to humanities? And um, can you explain what the special snowflake is? It's an underserved snowflake, um, is the first thing that I would say. Um, we come to the humanities by virtue of being in the humanities. You know, I work for the Modern Language Association, it's our field. Um, we understand our members to have um, certain uh, needs to communicate across fields with one another that haven't been served by a network like SSRN, for instance, um, or by other networks that have been available out there. And so our, our goal is not to limit things to the humanities, but rather to begin there with a platform that then, if we want to continue federating outward, fabulous. Um, but again, it's just that, that desire to serve the community in which we exist and then to connect from there um, rather than beginning by attempting to create the network of everything. Yeah, thanks for that. I was just wondering what specific features are targeted at serving, what are, what are the specific underserved needs that you perceive that you feel you'll be able to address? That's a very large question. Um, a big part of the need has to do with our members not having access to the kinds of resources in many cases that enable them to do the open work um, that they may or may not want to do. They want to be in communication with one another, um, but they aren't, by and large, grant funded. Um, they aren't able, necessarily, to rely on their institutions to, to publish in um, author side fee-oriented publications. And so they're, they're looking for new means of simply connecting and sharing their work with one another. One of the things that we found particularly interesting thus far in the life of MLA Commons and um, the ways that our members have used it is that the most 
shared and downloaded and used materials that have been deposited in core in the repository um, have been syllabi, right? That our, our members really desperately want to share teaching materials with one another and to learn from the teaching materials that others are sharing as well. And that, um, it, it's probably not unique to the humanities, um, but it's very clear that there's a need there that hadn't been served to this point. So we're hoping to provide a space in which all of the research outputs of any variety um, that our members want to produce, whatever it is they're producing, their, their class notes, their syllabi, um, their lectures, their, their slide presentations, their posters, um, what have you, can be all together. Um, and that's, that's the goal. Is that any different from any other field? Ultimately, probably not. Um, but I kind of want to go back to something that Rebecca Kennison said in her, um, her lightning talk at the beginning of all of this yesterday, which is that you know, if we sort of start from the humanities and build a platform that works there, it'll work everywhere else. If you start from the sciences and build a platform for the sciences, it's not going to work for, for a lot of humanities folks. And so we're, we're hoping to be able to, whatever we build, share it with everybody else, because why not? Um, that's what we're in it for, is for the entire of the research community to be able to take advantage of the stuff that we're building. Well, please join me in thanking our panel. It's to the end of the session. Thank you very much.